In 1936, a man named Alan Turing published a paper so groundbreaking that many consider it the birth of computer science. Since the turn of the century, mathematicians had been struggling to answer a deceptively simple question. What exactly is a computer? And when they learned of Turing's work, they quickly agreed that he had solved it. What's strange is that Turing's definition of a computer appears totally unrelated to our usual concept of a computer. It's a simple and purely theoretical device, which makes it seem pretty weird that there was such little hesitation from the mathematical community to accept it. But Turing's invention, now called a Turing machine, is still the foundation for computer science. So what is this mysterious device? How do you actually use a Turing machine? A Turing machine consists of just three basic components. The first is an infinite tape divided into cells. Each cell contains a single symbol, like a numerical digit, a letter of the alphabet, or some other character. The input to the machine is an initial string of symbols written onto the tape, and it's surrounded by an infinite sequence of blank, or empty, symbols on both sides, so that the machine is able to tell where the input starts and ends. For now, suppose the input consists of only zeros and ones, but later we'll be using other characters as well. The second component of a Turing machine is called the tape head, which reads and writes symbols on the tape. The tape head starts at the first symbol of the input. Finally, there's a set of rules, called a state table, that tells the machine what to do based on what it sees. The machine starts in one of the states on the state table. In this example, that'll be state A, so we'll focus on this section. The first thing the machine does is read the symbol under the tape head. Here, that's a zero, so we'll follow this column of the state table, where we do three things. First, we write a new symbol to replace the symbol under the tape head, in this case a 1. Then, we move the tape head, in this case to the right. And lastly, we go to a new state, in this case, state B. Every column of the state table is of this form. You read the symbol under the tape head, and based on that symbol, you then write a new symbol, move the tape head either left or right, and then go to the next state. So for one more example, continuing on from state B, now we see a 1, so we write a blank symbol, move the tape head to the left, and go back to state A. You just keep on repeating these rules, and you'll notice that some columns of the state table lead to a special state called the halting state. That's when the machine stops, and whatever's left on the tape when the machine gets to the halting state is considered the output, or the result of the computation. That's how a Turing machine works. It's just governed by a simple set of rules. But the fascinating thing is that despite its unassuming appearance, a Turing machine can actually carry out any algorithm that a modern computer can. To see this in action, let's walk through how you could design a Turing machine to accomplish a basic task. Suppose the input is a number, and we want our machine to determine whether it's even or odd. The tape head starts at the beginning of the input, but to test if the number is even or odd, we just need to check the very last digit. If it's 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8, then the number is even, and otherwise the number is odd. So the first thing we need to do is move the tape head all the way to the end of the input. We can define a starting state to do this. We'll need one column in the starting state for each possible symbol the machine could read, in this case a digit 0 through 9, or a blank symbol. Our goal is to move right across the input without changing anything. So if the machine reads a digit, it should write the same digit and move right. The next state should remain the same, the starting state, so the machine continues scanning right. This process repeats until the machine encounters a blank symbol, which marks the end of the input. Now when we get to that blank, we need to position ourselves back on top of the final digit. So we should write a blank, move left to land on that final digit, and transition to a new state, which we'll call eval, where the machine will evaluate whether the final digit is a 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8. From here, we'll design the machine to output the answer, even or odd, to the right of the input. A capital E will mean the number is even, and a capital O will mean the number is odd. 
So in the eval state, if the tape head reads a 0, 2, 4, 6, or 8, we'll leave that symbol unchanged, move right over the blank, and go to a new state called E for even, since the number is even. If the tape head reads a 1, 3, 5, 7, or 9, we would do the same, but go to a state called O for odd. Note that we haven't defined what the machine should do if it reads a blank from the eval state. That's okay, because we'll never be reading a blank from the eval state. We'll be centered over the end of the input, and therefore we'll be reading a digit. But for completeness's sake, Turing designed the machine to shut down and halt immediately if it ever reads any character it isn't expecting. Now, in the states E and O, we just need to write the final answer. For E, we'll be reading a blank, and we need to write an E for even, and then halt. For O, it's the same, except we write an O for odd. Now we're done. We can see that the machine correctly marked 3,141,592 as an even number. The core ability of a Turing machine comes from its capacity to make decisions based on its observations. But what if there were some symbols on the tape that the machine couldn't recognize? Or even worse, what if some symbols changed randomly, or some parts of the tape were invisible, making it impossible to process information correctly? That sounds ridiculous, but it's honestly not too far off from my experience trying to decipher what's going on in the world today, and that's why I was super excited when Ground News reached out to me to sponsor this video. Ground News is a news comparison platform that works with independent organizations to rate the bias and factuality of media outlets to help keep you from falling prey to manipulative algorithms and sensationalized headlines. For example, the Trump administration recently started building a national citizenship data system aimed at verifying voter citizenship status. Left-leaning sources about this focus on potential privacy concerns created by the project and its implication for immigrants, while many headlines from the right look completely different, with one focusing on the new system's potential to reduce taxpayer losses to fraud. If you get information from one side of the political spectrum, you may be missing out on key points from the other side, and that's what Ground News fixes. Founded by a former NASA engineer, they're committed to providing information you can trust. Scan this QR code or go to ground.news slash purplemind to get 40% off their vantage plan and start getting to the truth. Big thanks to Ground News for sponsoring this video. And now, let's get back to Turing machines. Thus far, we've seen a relatively simple Turing machine that determines whether numbers are even or odd. But I want to show you one slightly more complicated Turing machine to help demonstrate what they're really capable of. For that, we'll walk through how you can compute an operation called a bitwise AND, denoted by this ampersand symbol. In a bitwise AND, you start with two strings of zeros and ones that have the same length. The result is built up from the input strings one digit at a time. The digit in the result will be a 1 if the top digit and the bottom digit are both 1s, hence the name bitwise AND. This is the case in the leftmost column. But if either one or both of the input digits are zeros, then the resulting digit is a zero. So in this example, where the inputs are 110 and 101, the final result is 100. For our Turing machine, suppose the input comes in the form of two equally long strings of zeros and ones separated by an ampersand symbol. Let's start by laying out the overarching strategy of our machine. It's going to be to take corresponding digits from the two inputs, and build up the result to the right of the inputs one digit at a time, based on each pair of input digits. You'll notice that once an input digit gets scanned, the machine writes an X over it to cross it off, letting the machine remember that that digit has been used when it comes back around for the next pair. The machine will repeatedly scan across the inputs until the last digit of the first input is an X since by then, both inputs will have been fully used, and thus the result will be fully written on the tape. You can see that we end up with the correct answer we calculated from before. The bitwise AND of 110 and 101 is 100. Now, by no means does this process that we just described for our machine tell you specifically how to construct its state table and your instinct might be to question whether it's even possible to build a state table for the machine that makes it follow the conceptual procedure we imagined. 
But incredibly, there's actually almost always a way to implement these sorts of abstract ideas for a Turing machine's behavior as a state table. This is a really important quality for any computation method to have, and it's what drives the appeal of using high-level programming languages like C, for example, where we can think about and write code in terms of more conceptual ideas of what we want a program to do, and rest assured that the compiler will be able to translate those ideas into specific machine instructions. So that being said, here's the state table for our Turing machine that computes bitwise ands. You can pause the video here if you want to figure out exactly how it works to produce the desired outcome. The fact that a machine with such a simple set of rules can accomplish even moderately complex tasks is already impressive. But amazingly, machines like the ones we've covered in this video barely even scratch the surface of what's possible. When Alan Turing published his original paper in 1936, he already knew that the full potential of his machines extends even further beyond what their minimalist design may suggest. He wrote, the computable numbers include all numbers which would naturally be regarded as computable. In other words, anything you would naturally consider computable could be computed by one of his machines. Though it may not be immediately obvious from their definition, Turing had carefully designed his machine specifically to be capable of accomplishing any computational task possible, no matter how complicated. The arguments he made in his paper supporting this idea were so strong that the mathematical community was quickly on board, one of the strongest advocates being Alonzo Church, who had even proposed his own model of computation called Lambda Calculus that same year. This was a big deal. For over 30 years, several influential mathematicians besides Church, including Emil Post and Kurt Gödel, had tried to formally define computation, but neither of them were confident enough to even publish their ideas. So how was everyone so sure that the Turing machine was the right model for computation? I mean, we've seen it can do relatively involved tasks like determining whether numbers are even or odd, or calculating bitwise ands, but those are just a couple of examples. What exactly did Turing bring to the table that so quickly settled a decades-long debate about the nature of computation? To answer that question, we need to understand what computation means intuitively. For Turing, it meant something a lot different from how we think about computation today. In the 1930s, computers were extremely rudimentary. In fact, the word computer didn't even refer to a physical device yet. Computers were humans who carried out calculations by hand, many of whom were women employed by various research institutions or government agencies. Turing asked, what's the simplest machine that could model that human process? When we humans compute, we're simply writing symbols on pieces of paper. Ideally, unlimited paper, and hence the infinite tape on Turing machines. When our eyes read symbols on a page to take in information and determine what to write next, that's like the tape head scanning across the input, one symbol at a time. Turing also believed that when a human computes something, the only thing determining their next move is their current place on the page and their current mental state. As in, if you were in the middle of adding two really big numbers by hand, and you wanted to take a lunch break, you might circle the spot where you were writing and jot down what you were currently thinking. Then when you come back from lunch, you could read your notes to jog your memory and pick up where you left off. Turing machines work exactly like this. I could always give you any partially completed Turing machine run, and as long as you get to see the tape head position and the current state, you could continue running the machine from there. Another important part of Turing's considerations was that humans may switch between many different mental states based on their observations, and change their behavior based on their current mental state. This is precisely what the state table does. 
it helps the machine alter its behavior based on its current state. But the most convincing piece of evidence indicating that Turing machines are an all-encompassing model of computation is that you can build a Turing machine that simulates any other Turing machine. Turing called this a universal machine. This mirrors what our brains do when we compute different things. One day we might multiply numbers together, the next day we might calculate integrals, and the next day we might take logarithms. We can seamlessly switch between many different tasks. With a universal Turing machine, you can do the same. Instead of building a new machine for every task, you can encode a description of the machine you want as a sequence of symbols on the input tape to a single general purpose machine, which could then behave as if it were the machine you described. Universal Turing machines are programmable, which is the principle behind every modern computer. In fact, this principle is included in many search results when you look up the definition of a computer on the internet. We accept Turing machines as the standard model for computation not because they're fast, practical, or realistic, but because they represent at a fundamental level what it means to compute anything at all. That idea became known as the Church-Turing thesis, as Turing had shown that Church's lambda calculus was in fact an equally capable model of computation as the Turing machine. Over time, the Church-Turing thesis has been consistently reinforced. It's been shown that virtually all modern programming languages can be simulated by a Turing machine, meaning whatever can be achieved by our computers today, Turing machines can do as well. The true genius of Turing's invention wasn't the machine itself, but rather the intuition and motivation behind its design that gave us a concrete, mathematically rigorous definition of computation. Just by abstracting the process of a human calculating something on a piece of paper, Turing was able to lay the foundation for all of computer science, which remarkably still holds up today. It's easy to forget that foundation now that we live in a digital age, full of hyper-optimized supercomputers working at lightning speed. But your laptop, your phone, and even the world's most advanced supercomputers are all just physical implementations of Turing's simple idea a way of organizing and processing information which he modeled after our own brains. So the proven ability of our best computers now is only a testament to how powerful our minds are. Each person has the full potential to compute anything that is computable. It's just up to us to decide what to do with that power.